Israel certainly taking on all comers. Monday's airstrike in Damascus that killed three senior Iranian commanders, uh, the most spectacular of its kind since Hamas's October 7th attack on Israel. We'll ask about Tehran's response, whether it will try to draw in the United States, and after months of cross-border rocket exchanges between Israel and Lebanon, about the risk of all-out war on a second front. Meanwhile, the nightmare continues for Gaza. Will the killing of seven aid workers and the beginnings of a famine force Israel to wind down operations there? Last week, its closest ally, the U.S., abstained on a U.N. ceasefire resolution, thus sending its strongest signal yet that it's time to wind down what will soon be six months of war. So far, that's not happening. Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking how far will escalate. Joining us from Washington, Barbara Slavin, lecturer at George Washington University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. From Herzliya in Israel, Eli Carmon, senior fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism of Reichman University. Welcome to the show. Uh, good evening. Thank you. And we welcome back John Linden, executive director of uh, the Alliance for Middle East Peace Umbrella Group. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Uh, two airstrikes making news. Let's begin with the one in Syria. Two generals, five military advisors killed. Iran's supreme leader uh, put out a statement vowing revenge for Monday's strike. Karis Garland has more. It represents a major escalation in Israel's fighting with its regional adversaries. Suspected Israeli warplanes on Monday destroyed the consular annex of the Iranian embassy in Damascus. Tehran said several military officers were killed and vowed revenge. The Zionist regime knows better than anyone that such crimes and violating international law will have its response in an appropriate time. According to Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps, Mohammad Reza Zahedi, a top commander of its Quds Force, died in the strike, along with his deputy. The Quds Force supports Hamas and other allied militant groups like Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the Yemeni Houthis. Israel has long targeted Iran's military installations in Syria and those of its proxies, but the attacks have intensified since October 7. Monday's strike was the fifth in a week to hit Syria, a close ally of Iran. It also comes after an escalation in cross-border fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon. Last week, the Israeli defense minister signaled the country would be taking a more proactive approach in the region. We've turned from being the ones repelling Hezbollah to the ones who are chasing them. We reach all the places they're present. The attack on the Iranian consulate prompted demonstrations in Tehran. Protesters burned Israeli and American flags and called for Iran to respond to the attack. Barbara Slavin, uh, why did this happen now? Tell us about the timing of this uh, when you first heard about this operation. First of all, thanks again. I'm now a distinguished fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington. Just oh, to get good, good. Thank you for the correction. Attribution. I do teach at GW, though, as well. Okay. Why now? Uh, look, Israel has been following the activities of senior Iranian generals for a very long time. And this is not the first time that Israel has assassinated uh, high-level Iranians. Uh, but I think Israel wants to send a message to Iran that its, its whole strategy of so-called forward defense, of supporting the so-called axis of resistance, in other words, fighting Israel indirectly through proxies, is, is not a strategy that Israel accepts. And uh, the, the senior general who was killed in Damascus was apparently in charge of uh, Iranian uh, liaison with uh, security forces in both Syria and Lebanon, with Hezbollah. Um, so it was a very clear message that Israel is going to go after anyone it considers to be an adversary in a war that uh, I don't think Israel has ever seen limited just to, to Gaza. Uh, we're also in a situation where there's still no ceasefire. And so I, there's a bit of the sort of Israel getting in its last licks, whatever you want to call it, before hopefully there will be a ceasefire, uh, going after as many targets as possible. 
Uh, but of course, this is very dangerous, and it's very dangerous for the American military presence in the region, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah, a we'll, we'll, uh, couple of important points in what you said there. Uh, first off, Ellie Carman, do you have this sense that uh, this is a window of opportunity before a potential ceasefire, the way uh, Barbara just uh, framed it? No, I don't think it's connected to the ceasefire, but I, I like to give a wider context. Uh, I think that uh, this is not a simple uh, tick for tack uh, between Israel and uh, Iran in uh, Syria. Uh, yeah, Hamas has attacked uh, on the 7th of October in coordination with Iran and Hezbollah and the uh, Houthis in Yemen. They wage a complete war against Israel. Hezbollah has attacked on the 8th of October without any reason uh, and is firing missiles and rockets every day. Uh, in Syria, uh, the pro-Iranian militias and Hezbollah are firing uh, rockets and missiles on the Golan Heights. And the Houthis, just yesterday, they fired, or two days ago, uh, a long-range uh, uh, drone, and from the Iraqi forces, pro-Iranian Iraqi forces, have uh, uh, fired at the Eilat uh, harbor uh, just uh, 24 hours ago. So this is an uh, Iranian war on all fronts against Israel, and it's not new, because the regime in Tehran since its inception in 1979, has declared that it wants to destroy Israel. It is the only country in the world that the United Nations is uh, speaking about destroying the Zionist regime. And the other countries seem to be uh, accepting this kind of, uh, not only uh, rhetoric, but a kind of permanent war against Israel. So I think uh, Israel has to respond. Uh, it responded already. But we see an escalation on the side of the Hezbollah and of the Houthis and the uh, pro-Iranian uh, Iraqi uh, militias. Well, and Iran these... is now saying that it's going to respond. You heard Barbara Slave and wonder aloud whether that response will draw in the United States. What kind of a response, Eli, are you expecting from Iran? I think that there will be a direct response by Iran for two reasons. One reason is that uh, there is a very important uh, uh, leadership that was hit by Israel. Uh, the two persons, especially Reza Hadi Zaidi and his uh, deputy, are coordinating all the Iranian and pro-Iranian forces in Syria and Lebanon. Uh, the uh, Zaidi has been in the past the head of the ground forces and the air forces of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards. Uh, and he is the practically the one who continues the work of uh, General Qasem Soleimani, which the Americans uh, killed uh, in 2020, uh, also through a strike in Baghdad, when, by the way, Soleimani was preparing to attack the uh, American embassy in Baghdad. So uh, this is not uh, a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, decision by Israel, if it is Israel, because until now Israel has not taken responsibility. I assume that Israel is responsible, but I'm not the one who can uh, really be the one, the authority which uh, says this. But still, uh, the uh, fact that it was in a place that the Iranians are claiming that this is the consulate of Iran. So according to Israeli uh, information, this is not uh, exactly a consulate. This is a building which was taken uh, by the uh, uh, diplomats and uh, by the military forces of IRGC in order to uh, build a kind of general quarter to fight Israel on all fronts. Mm. So uh, this is one reason the very important uh, uh, place of these leaders uh, in the Iranian uh, uh, military and strategic leadership. And the second is uh, legitimizing or trying to legitimize it by uh, uh, claiming that it was uh, Iranian territory, Iranian consulate. Right. Uh, Barbara Slavin, uh, uh, these were senior commanders uh, inside the, the, the Revolutionary Guards that were killed. Uh, Eli Carmon, uh, alluding to uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, uh, the response to that resulted in zero casualties for the Americans at the time. No, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, the Iranians uh, sent ballistic missiles directly from Iran into al-Assad air base outside Baghdad. Uh, the Iranians tipped off the Iraqis that this is what they were going to do. So the Americans 
were in bunkers, but a hundred of them suffered rather severe concussions, other kinds of uh, injuries. and uh, Zero fatalities, I meant, sorry. Zero fatalities, right. right. Subsequently, there were other attacks on Americans uh, in, in Iraq. So now, that was in the United States. This time it's Israel. What kind of response are you expecting? Well, uh, Iran has difficulty retaliating directly against Israel. That's why I'm very concerned that we're going to see instead uh, more attacks on Americans. There are still 900 plus American service uh, personnel in Syria, where they're uh, ostensibly working on countering ISIS, but they're mostly watching Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, and we have 2,500 American service uh, personnel in Iraq. And in fact, the Iraqi prime minister is coming to Washington in a couple of weeks to talk about drawing down that force. I think all of these events are going to lead to a more rapid U.S. withdrawal, military withdrawal from the Middle East. And I'm not sure that's what Israel, that's necessarily in Israel's interest, but uh, that's, that seems to be where we're going. John Linden? Yeah, I mean, I agree with that analysis. It's, um, you know, the, the kind of catalyst for these events from October 7th have sort of set in train this chain reaction in very many different directions. Um, and, and I think the... I think if you could replay this period again, I'm not sure that Israel would have done exactly what it has done um, and the, the order and sequencing of different priorities and operations. Because, you know, as you heard from Yoav Galant, their analysis is that Iran is at the center of, of this problem and that it's projecting force onto Israel's borders. They've now spent six months fighting the weakest of their local enemies, Hamas, and with no end in sight, with deteriorating levels of international support and legitimacy and credibility, um, before turning to a much stronger adversary, which is Hezbollah, who have over 100,000 uh, rockets, many of which are, are, are highly precise, that they dwarf anything that Hamas has. And then, of course, you've got, in the Israeli parlance, the head of the snake, Iran itself in the way that they think about this sort of hierarchy of threats. And if you're going sequentially from the weakest towards the strongest, you would want to really make sure that you have the, the international backing and support and legitimacy and armaments to sustain such a, a campaign. And the second dimension is really looking at the US piece of this, because my sense is that nobody in Washington, certainly nobody in government in Washington, wants a war with Iran this side of an election or, or, or the other side of it either, to be honest. And speaking to Iran watchers earlier, the same can be said in the other direction. Uh, Iran doesn't want a direct confrontation with the United States. No, I mean, everyone always forgets that Iran has domestic politics too, right? Uh, and the Iranians are going through probably the most um, uh, unstable period, maybe since the Iran-Iraq war, uh, with regards to internal coherence, opposition to the regime, very, very strong and sustained protests in most major cities and many small towns across the entire country. They're obviously um, regionally isolated, uh, although it's interesting, in a strange way, the, lo the longer the war goes on in Gaza, I wonder whether that isolation may diminish a little bit. If you think about it from Israel's perspective, they were creating informally or, in or formally a coalition against Iran amongst the uh, Sunni Gulf states predominantly. The war in Gaza is making it much more difficult for that coalition to be sustained just at the moment that Israel perhaps needs it as it's beginning to think about um, uh, an operation against Iran. Um, the, the final point as well, because we haven't discussed it, is the Lebanese piece. Um, you know, because right in the middle of this sandwich is, is Lebanon, which is a quasi-failed state at the moment, where you have this terrorist organization, Hezbollah, playing an outsized role in its politics, really capturing the south of the country. Um, uh, and I really, I know I would say this, I would love to see time and space being given to actual diplomacy to defuse this, because the, the, the northern front for Israel is the gateway towards very, very bad things happening over the coming months if it's allowed to escalate. And Amos Hochstein, the, the US envoy in Lebanon, he had been doing shuttle diplomacy and discussions to try and get Hezbollah forces redeployed to north of the Latani River. I think diplomacy could do that. I think it should be given the chance to bear fruit. And I think particularly regional actors, I know Jake Sullivan is off to Saudi Arabia this, this, this week, they should be brought to bear. If you can move Hezbollah north of the Latani, I think you straight away pull the pressure and intensity out of this uh, escalation. Eli Carmon, you agree? Um, I don't agree with the uh, uh, evaluation that uh, the main uh, uh, target of the Iranians will be the Americans. Uh, not at all. They promised and they will uh, uh, do, do it because, uh, as I said, for the honor of the IRGC, uh, because there uh, is now a very conservative, very radical, majlis parliament. Also, and some of the public opinion, not the majority, but some of the conservatives in the public opinion are asking for retaliation and a strong retaliation. But I think the Iranians 
not only are not interested, they cannot exactly at this moment enter a, a full war because they are continuing their nuclear program. They are very close of uh, building a military capability, nuclear capability. We heard about the IAEA uh, last report, which says that uh, the Iranians are uh, hiding a lot of their activity from the organization, the United Nations organization. Uh, we know that they have already the possibility, theoretically, to build five uh, atomic bombs, and this is the main goal of the regime for the moment. Uh, and therefore, there will be a reaction. For instance, uh, firing uh, uh, many, I would say, uh, long-range drones and uh, uh, missiles, especially uh, cruise missiles, to very important strategic uh, military and perhaps even economic uh, infrastructure targets. The second possibility is also to stage a huge uh, bombing of an Israeli embassy, uh, like they did uh, in 1992 and 1994 in Buenos Aires. They uh, destroyed the Israeli embassy and then the Jewish uh, building of Amia. Uh, but uh, they will do it, in my opinion, in countries which are not uh, prepared uh, from the point of view of intelligence and law enforcement to challenge them, and also politically. Uh, for instance, in Africa, uh, some countries in South America, or even in Central Asia. So they have this possibility to retaliate and without entering a full war uh, with Israel. All right, it's another Israeli strike that's uh, got the world's attention this Tuesday in Gaza's southernmost city, Rafa. There was the funeral of uh, Saif Abu Taha. He was one of those uh, seven staff members of a World Central Kitchen convoy that was targeted. Uh, Palestinians killed, as well as workers from Australia, Britain, Poland, a dual citizen of the U.S. and Canada. The World Central Kitchen uh, cars were vetted and emblazoned with its logo. Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports the military was targeting a Hamas militant who was armed, but not present in that convoy. International reactions range from calls for clarification to strong condemnation. This is just uh, completely uh, unacceptable. Uh, Australia expects full accountability for the deaths of aid workers, uh, which is completely unacceptable. Uh, aid workers and those doing humanitarian work and indeed all innocent civilians need to be provided with protection. We want full accountability for this because this is a tragedy that should never have occurred. Uh, Barbara Slavin, we've all had in the last hours the uh, Israeli ambassador to the UK as well as the US Israeli ambassador to Poland uh, summoned three British citizens uh, uh, among those killed. Is this going to change the equation? Well, one would hope so. I mean, I think we've already seen public opinion shift uh, in the West, uh, not everywhere, but certainly in the United States where there was overwhelming support for Israel after the Hamas uh, atrocities of October 7th. We have, uh, over time, as more and more uh, Palestinian civilians have been killed and as Gaza has now is is experiencing famine in in parts of it as we've seen hospitals destroyed you didn't mention shifa hospital where uh israeli troops uh occupied it for two weeks and have essentially completely destroyed what was the most important facility healthcare facility in gaza yes there were hamas people there but uh you know one has to ask whether these kinds of tactics really worked so there was a gallup poll in the u.s just last week 55% of Americans no longer support Israeli actions. Uh, that number includes 75% of Democrats and 60% of independents, which means that uh, Israeli support in the United States is now primarily uh, among uh, Republicans and a certain slice of Republicans. This is not a good place for Israel to be. It is really losing bipartisan support. And this war has gone on far too long um, it's, it, you know, for so many reasons, we need an urgent ceasefire. But this particular incident, I mean, H Jose Andres, World Central Kitchen, it, you know, people want him to get the Nobel Peace Prize for the work he's done, not just in Gaza, but in so many other conflict zones, including Ukraine. Um, so uh, I know Israel was quick to say this was a mistake, 
But, you know, even if there was a Hamas operative who somehow got into the convoy, would that have justified killing these seven innocent aid workers? There's something wrong here. And uh, Israeli calculations really have to change and change fast. Uh, Eli Carmon, uh, what, what are people saying where you are? The phone. The prime minister, the minister of defense, and the heads of the IDF has taken responsibility. They say it's a strategic mistake, and it will be uh, investigated uh, very fully. And also, uh, all the results of the investigation will be presented to the uh, organization that was hit, but also to the international community. Uh, and this happens in uh, in war. You know that uh, Israeli forces have killed three of the Israeli hostages, which succeeded in uh, uh, leaving uh, the uh, tunnels where they were taken as prisoners, and they were killed by uh, Israeli soldiers. And uh, in the friendly fire between Israeli soldiers in Gaza, there are at least 20, at least 20 soldiers killed by Israelis. So this happened in, in war. But, uh, when but, but happened, I just want to point out one Gaza, thing. C central to what Barbara Slavin was saying is this feeling by the international community that the war has now gone on too long. We're approaching the six-month point. Do Israelis sense that? Israelis are not happy with the uh, uh, government of Israel uh, waging this war. Uh, many in Israel consider the prime minister, especially because he did not uh, decide uh, what will be after war in Gaza. Uh, contrary to many of the uh, officers and the experts in the defense establishment, which uh, want to Im uh, involve the Palestinian Authority together with Egypt, Jordan, and Gulf countries in finding a solution, first of all, a political solution, and then a uh, uh, security solution uh, for the control, for instance, how the humanitarian aid will arrive to the citizens, because for the moment, still it is stolen by the Hamas. Most of this uh, the, uh, humanitarian aid is stolen still by the Hamas, including in northern uh, Gaza, where Israel is supposed to be uh, to, to, to control. So there is a problem of the government that it has not decided, has not decided what to do, and therefore there is a the discrepancy between the Israeli position uh, and the American administration, between Israeli position and the international community, and the Israeli government, if you want and much of its uh, citizens and uh, political uh, elements. John Linden, uh, you, you have um, uh, people from your organization who are on, in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in Israel. Um, gee, is there a sense that time is up now after what happened here? Yeah, I mean, for the peace-building community, time has been up a, a long time ago. Every day this war goes on, number one, the regional escalation we spoke about in the first part of the show, we roll the dice every day on a wider regional war. And to do that for nearly 180 days is is uh, very, very dangerous. And then much more sort of from, from a human perspective, the devastation in Gaza it's truly beyond belief. I mean, Barbara mentioned the, the scenes from Shifa Hospital uh, over the weekend. And again, we've, we have so, so much difficulty getting information about exactly what's taking place, but we're, we're being kind of consumed by these images, which really test all of our uh, ideas about some sort of a community of shared values and, uh, and, and humanity. Um, and on the specific events overnight, I just want to really put it into the wider context. Barbara mentioned this, the IPC has declared um, the presence of famine or the famine is imminent in, in the north of the Gaza Strip, but about half a million people at real, real acute end of, of food insecurity. And some of the images we've seen, it's, it's, it's inconvertible. You can see it physically that people are, are starving. Um, we now have the two main aid agencies uh, who have withdrawn or suspended their uh, access today. So World Central Kitchen, as you mentioned, but also in NERA. It's over 600,000 daily meals, which wasn't enough yesterday, that now aren't arriving tomorrow. We had uh, 240 tonnes of aid that was being facilitated via the maritime port that World Central K Kitchen put together on its way from Cyprus to Gaza, which has now turned around and gone back to Cyprus. And the UAE has said that it's, it's, it's suspending its provision of aid because people cannot be assured the security and the safety of aid professionals. And to the point about the risk calculation, for seven um, aid professionals, uh, humanitarian workers in a car, if there had been a Hamas member in that car, there wasn't, but if there had been, so number one, there's a, there's a proportionality question, right? Whether, whether taking out the, those innocent civilians, international aid workers is proportionate with, for the, uh, the strategic value of taking out a Hamas member. But then there's a larger consideration. If that strike results in 600,000 meals every day not being delivered to starving people, 
How does that affect our risk calculus? I, I, I think we're on the cusp of there being more daily fatalities in Gaza from the humanitarian crisis than from the war. And, and, and I think the, the same level of seriousness and rigor and strategic insight that people are given to these wider geostrategic questions in the region, I would like those brain cells to be deployed on how we're going to feed the people of Gaza and avert a full famine arriving in the Gaza Strip. Because for that to happen on our watch at this six-month war, whilst the international community looks on, it's, it's unforgivable. We'll have to leave it there for now, unfortunately. John Linden, I want to thank you. I want to thank Yali Carmon for being with us from Herzliya. Barbara Slavin in Washington, thank you for being with us here in the France.